Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome horse-loving friends, horse-book-loving friends, and people who love them. <laughs> I'm Tish Kalimer. I'm the Director of Community Engagement here at the Gail Gordon Public Library. And in case you don't know, we are 150 years old. We celebrated the exact day we opened, which was yesterday. I don't think we look a day over 140. <laughs> So we just want to thank everybody who's been a longtime library supporter, user, and friend. Uh, we have actually a tie-in with tonight's program. Marguerite Henry used to live in Wayne uh, for several years, and she would do research for some of her famous books at the Gail Borden Public Library. Now, it would have been the, the building over on Spring Street, um, and uh, Susan will tell us all about that. So let me introduce to you our author and guest, Susan Friedland. She is the author of Marguerite, Misty, and Me, A Horse Lover's Hunt for the Hidden History of Marguerite Henry and Her Chincoteague Pony. Susan never grew out of that horse phase. In 2018, after rereading Misty of Chincoteague for the first time as an adult, Susan was inspired to hunt for the backstory of her favorite horse book author and set off on an epic adventure which began at the Gail Borden Public Library, the library where Marguerite Henry researched her iconic books like Misty, Brighty of the Grand Canyon, and King of the Wind, which was the 1949 Newbery Medal winner. Susan tracked down friends of Marguerite's from her days riding and writing in Wayne, explored the Chincoteague Pony subculture during Pony Penning Week with a front row kayak seat for the famous Pony Swim, and uncovered Marguerite's unpublished manuscripts held in an underground cavern in Minnesota. In addition to Susan's four horse-themed nonfiction books, she has been actively blogging on her award-winning equestrian lifestyle blog, SaddleSeeksHorse.com. We encourage you to visit. She's been doing that since 2013. Susan's writing has been featured in various horse magazines, from Horse Illustrated to Sidelines, and she is a host of the Horse Illustrated Barn Banter Podcast. I love that title. <laughs> and has been a speaker at Equitana, American Horse Publications Conferences, the International Museum of the Horse, and the Museum of Chincoteague Island. When Susan's not traveling on equestrian adventures, she's trotting around on her ex-racehorse, Tis a Night, in nearby Bull Valley here in Illinois. Please welcome Susan Friedland. I am thrilled to talk about horses. I love horses, I love horse books, I love model horses, I love people who love horses, and it's a delight to be at what I consider my home library. Because I was a little girl growing up in the 80s, and all I wanted was a horse of my very own, and I couldn't have one because I had two older sisters headed to college. That wasn't very cool, but I found Marguerite Henry's books at the Gail Borden Library, and my childhood best friend, who just sneaked in the door, uh, Gail, you want to wave? Gail and I would come to the library and find all of the books. They were in the Dewey Decimal System, 636. I don't know why I'm terrible at numbers. I'm so bad at 636 and 798. So it was like horse care and I think riding, equitation, that sort of thing. So Gail and I, for fun, would come to the library and check out books. We'd have a stack like this, and I remember feeling very shy and tentative when I'd get to the desk to check them out. I thought I'd get yelled at because I had too many, but I never got yelled at. It was amazing. <laughs> so anyway, it's just a, a privilege to be here and a joy, and it's so fun to see people that I have a long history with. So thank you, everyone, um, old friends and friends I haven't yet met. Um, this is my horse, Knight. He is a retired thoroughbred racehorse. I bored him. This photo was taken um, in Woodstock and Bull Valley. And um, this beautiful woman go, roaming around the room taking the photos um, had me. She's like, oh, this is going to be a great shot. And I was sitting there. I don't tell all my people this. I'm like, this is so awkward. I would never do this. I would never just lean up against 
you know, he would never come over me, you know, and graze like that. But she said, no, trust me, the photo is going to be beautiful. And it really is, but it felt extremely staged in the middle of it. So you already know that I read all of Margaret Henry's books growing up, but um, I'm from South Elgin. I went to Willard School and I learned to ride in Wayne in the 80s. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But my professional career, I was an educator. So I taught middle school for 22 years, English and history. Two of those years were in Chicago at a charter school in Rogers Park. And then the majority of the 20 years I taught in Arcadia, California, which is known for Santa Anita Racetrack, which interestingly, interestingly enough, I'm gonna just brag here for a moment about my horse. He was a terrible racehorse, but he won one race and it was at Santa Anita, and my classroom was like three miles away, but we didn't know each other existed until years later. But um, I found his win photo, and would you believe, Victor Espinosa, the Triple Crown winning jockey, was the jockey on my horse to the night, so kind of cool. But anyway, um, there's me as a little girl in South Elgin, so happy with my little hobby horse. And then there's me as an awkward late teen, early 20 something. That's over at Lamplight Equestrian Center. And that is my horse, DC. And he was also a dark bay thoroughbred. And then there's my horse, Knight, my current horse. You can see I have a type when it comes to horses. <laughs> so before I wrote Margaret, Misty, and Me, I had these questions. And it started when I found this book on my bookshelf. I don't even know what book I was going for, but it was like a forgotten friend there on my bookshelf. And I pulled it off and I read the story and it captivated me and I fell in love with this all over again. And by this time, I was, you know, teaching. I was teaching. 11 and 12 year olds, middle school, English and history, and you know, trying to get kids to write and looking at the language and just thinking like, this book has really stood the test of time. And I don't even know if my students, and I was at a high performing school in California, I don't know if they would know some of this vocabulary. And some of this, you know, might be a little bit over their head. But so I knew that there was this connection that I had to her story because of geography. But um, I thought it would be fun. I wanted to gauge the, oh, there's my cousin just walking in. Everyone say hi, Kurt. Hi, <laughs> Kurt. So anyway, I posted on Instagram and people were really responding. And this is because I have a blog that um, Tish mentioned. So I posted there. I did a blog post about rereading Misty as an adult. And it was like people came out of the woodwork to tell me about their Misty connection or their Marguerite Henry story. Um, one of my friends in California that I rode with quite a bit said, oh, I went to a book signing that she did and she sent me a photo of her and um, it, it's good blackmail material. She was very awkward looking at <laughs> us, as we all do at that age. But anyway, so I went down the, the rabbit hole. Then there's my horse night, we're kind of in the middle. I took up um, fox hunting which this is in Southern California. Who knew there was fox hunting in Southern California? There's fox hunting here in Illinois and it's really big in like Virginia and Maryland. But anyway, I went on this fox hunt and I started wondering about Marguerite Henry because I had read the book and I knew where her house was in Wayne and it's right across from where there's a kennel and there's an active fox hunt. So I thought, I wonder if she's an equestrian like me or was she simply someone who loved horses and had horses in her life? You know, did she take riding lessons? Did she go to horse shows? I mean, I was spiraled down, really <laughs> deep down. And then I started thinking about how there's always an answer to these things. And so kind of my five guiding questions were about, you know, her horse background. Who was she before she was a famous author? You know, did she have another career? Was she an educator like me? And then I thought, I wonder if I can still find people out there who knew her. I was going to look for her children or grandchildren. And then I was thinking like, why are these books 
so powerful still. And I've had conversations both in the process of writing Marguerite, Misty, and Me, and since then, where I will connect with another horse lover and we start, the tears start falling. And it's like, <laughs> so embarrassing but it's like what is it about this book i read so many books in my childhood what is it about these books of marguerite that is so beautiful and has a hold on us then i wanted to understand she could take ponies because i'd never seen one or ridden one and you know with like do people love that like what's up with the she could take ponies you know i'm a big fan of off-track thoroughbreds i love the thoroughbred breed I've had a quarter horse, but it was like, okay, you know, what is it about these little ponies? And I found out. It took me two years. Oh, here's my awkward family photo. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's Jim Dandy. He was probably about 25 year old quarter horses. So Marguerite allowed me entry to the horse world when I didn't have a way to get there on my own. Then through a twist of interesting events, some uh, people my parents met, I think through small town politics, found out they had one of those girls that all she could do was talk about horses. And they said, well, we have horses. Bring your daughter out and ride ours. And so I did. And I didn't really have formal lessons. And there, if, if you're a rider too, you might remember those helmets that weren't really protective. It was more of just a, a sh show piece there for your head. But um, so I got out and rode through Pratt's Wayne Woods on the Illinois Prairie Path with some other girls and we just kind of went off and rode and we didn't die. <laughs> we had fun. This is before cell phones and GPS. So here's the other thing. So my mom worked at a Kellenberger Chiropractic many, many years ago. And I, she probably was telling her coworker, a friend named Mary Ellen, like, my daughter is kind of obsessed. All she does is talk about horses and every day, you know, can we have a horse? No. But so Mary Ellen said, oh, I rode that Misty pony. <laughs> what? People could ride Misty the pony? I don't understand. So, so she gave this photo to my mom and I'm thinking this is early 50s. And so this is my mom's friend, Mary Ellen, on the actual famous, beautiful, Misty of Chicoteague here at Mole Meadow in Wayne, Illinois, near St. Charles. So I wrote a blog post about this, and I'm not, I haven't told my other group that. And a gentleman who grew up in Wayne, but who lives on the East Coast now, he's not an equestrian. He told me, he left a, he sent me this long email and said, thank you for those memories of Wayne, which like I just wrote about the picture and what the history was. And so I was like, hey, can I call you? Did, do you know, Mar you know, were you like friends with Marguerite? What's the story? And he was very apologetic. He said, I, I went to the house, I pet the pony, but you need to talk to, and he gave me a list of all these people that I really should talk to. And so it was like, you, you just keep doing this. And, the, and at first when I started, I thought, I had been writing for horse magazines like, oh, everyone loves Marguerite Henry. I'll write a nice little article. People will love it. And then the more that was there, it was like, oh my gosh, this needs to be a book. So there's a whole lot of long stories in here, which you can read about in Marguerite Misty and Me. But I decided to leave Southern California in 2021. And I knew that Marguerite lived the last several years of her life in Rancho Santa Fe. So I thought, okay, I'm going back to the Chicago area. I need to make sure like I get down to the Rancho Santa Fe library. Um, I, and again, I didn't know what I was looking for, but like I knew she lived there like, and she was a writer. They had to know something. So I walked in and said, I am researching Marguerite Henry, the author who used to live here. Do you have any local newspaper, you know, and they're like, oh no, but we have a cabinet with old photo albums. Would you like to see it? I was like, sure. So I go over, there wasn't even a chair. So I'm sitting cross-legged on the floor in the middle of the library, very sophisticated. And they bring out, you know, they shut, there's this whole shelf that is those old timey photo albums where you like peel the sticky thing and the photos are stuck there. And so I found some articles and it showed that the library had had displays with Marguerite's books. And 
that sort of thing. Well then, as I'm sitting there, a different librarian approaches me and said, would you like to see the private Marguerite Henry collection? <laughs> so, why, yes, I would. <laughs> so they have, and I was just there last week giving a talk at the same library. They have these two locked cabinets and inside are some treasures. So this is one of Marguerite's not as well-known books. Um, it was called Gaudenzia, the, and then it was The Pride of the Palio, and then it was later uh, retitled The Wildest Horse Race in the World. So this is like the interior art, the, the original from that. Oh, there's the book. Oh. And then this is just so precious. Okay, so maybe you can help me sleuth a little. So Pictorial Life Story of Misty, and here's a Misty postcard, and I'm gonna, have you read the postcard? I don't think it's about that book. But so this is Marguerite's writing, which I got to know over the course of 50 years. I'm so sorry to have read this slowly. It is so good, but I'm ready to return it and please charge me for the overdays. <laughs> Thought you might like to keep this review in the book, Marguerite Henry. I'm positive she wouldn't be rereading her own book and saying <laughs> those things about her own book. She's a very humble woman, as I learned, but I just, I love her handwriting. I love that she, was this famous Newberry author and did a little apology note there. Okay, this is a photo Tish sent to me. So this is from the, the Spring Street? <laughs> this would have been the Spring Street yeah. building. So you can see how times have changed, but this is Marguerite Henry works at Gail Borden Library there. Oh, and did you know who, who the woman is? Is that, Mil that's not Mildred Lathrop? It's not, and I don't know who it is. Okay, so a person at the library enjoying Marguerite Henry books in Elgin. Okay, so then I went to the University of Minnesota. So I found out the university there has 36 boxes containing Marguerite's personal papers, including unpublished manuscripts and some Wesley Dennis art. So I went to Minnesota and had to order. It was very different from a library like Yale Board because it's an academic library. Thankfully, it's open to anyone. You just have to schedule the boxes you want to see. There's Wesley Dennis art from a book titled Fools Over Horses. And you're going to love this. There are two unpublished works. Wow. So the first one was a book on miniature horses. The gentleman who was the photographer did portraits of famous people like Billy Graham, the Kennedys, various presidents, other presidents, and he was a National Geographic photographer. And it never saw the light of day. She wrote that when she was in her late 80s. She never retired, by the way. So I thought, as I was reading it, I'm like, there's people out there, like you and me, who want to read this. So I told the curator, I said, you guys need to publish this. And she said, well, we would love to, but Marguerite had it so that her work wouldn't get published. <coughs> okay, so the second one here, she wanted, thank you, by the way. She wanted to write a book about, there was this man living on Skid Row in Chicago with a pet dog. It was going to be called <coughs> Mr. Quackenbush and his <laughs> And her editor said, can you imagine if we publish this? Children will want ducks. They're very messy. <laughs> this is her Newberry medal for King of the Wind. <clears throat> she received the award in... Um, Michigan. She took Misty the Pony with her. There were some people in the library world that were not happy about having a pony at the event. <laughs> you can read about it in this book. But it was it was a thrill because I knew the Newberry Metal books are really special. You know, A Wrinkle in Time. I think Bud Not Buddy is one. But like, you know, all the Newberry Metal and that she not only won one, she won two honors as well. 
So speaking of King of the Wind, this is Wesley Dennis. That's sham as a, as a bowl, and that was a throw because it occurred to me later as I was looking at the picture, it's in color. You know, in the book, it's not in color. So that was really a treat. Um, she was born in Milwaukee. I don't know if you knew that. Born in Milwaukee in 1902. And her father was a printer. And this is his printing company, Bright Hop Printing. And what I find fascinating, 1947, you can see the year, she's taking notes about Man of War or King of the Wind on the back of calendar pages. <laughs> she wrote wherever she found paper. So some of the items in those boxes at the archives in Minnesota are pretty funny. The funniest thing she was taking notes on was, you know how if you buy a tablecloth, there's a cardboard insert to keep it nice and stiff? Notes on that. Notes everywhere. Notes on the back of bill envelopes. Notes on everything. And then here, of course, is an early version of Misty of Chincoteague. And one of the things about Marguerite is she would go to the places to research. So for that um, photo I showed you earlier, the wildest horse race in the world in Siena, she went to Italy three times. She even met with the Pope. I would have loved to know how she swung that, but <laughs> she was really a go-getter. Um, so the Museum of Chicoutique, they're wonderful. If you've never been, you need to go. It's a small museum. I hate to break the news, Misty is still with us in taxidermy form. It didn't do a very good job. But I asked the like the foremost historian on Chincoteague, like who did this map? Like how did the you know someone gave her and she said, you know, I don't recognize that as the you know, Chincoteague old timey historian's handwriting. And she said, Don't you think that's Marguerite's? So if you think about that, a woman from the Midwest going to Virginia, drawing the map. They didn't have GPS. I don't, yeah, it's just, it's kind of amazing to me what she did to be able to bring a story to life. And you can see BB Ranch over here. I'm sorry, I realize not all of you have read Misty of Chincoteague. That's where the setting is for Misty of Chincoteague, BB Ranch where these grandparents have these ponies. <coughs> and there she is in Wayne Aww. on this date. Very sweet. There's more pictures. So this is kind of fun. And if you've had horses, you might appreciate this. So her husband, Sydney, was, um, he owned uh, dime stores. So they had a store in Geneva. They had a store in Dundee. They had a store in Naperville. And he loved to golf. She didn't like to golf. So they would go to Florida. And the way she started to ride was on one of these trips to Florida, her husband was golfing. She found a polo grounds and went there, saw a polo trainer and said, I'd really like to learn how to ride a horse. So, okay. So she rode this horse on the right. It's a Morgan, his name's Friday. And she fell in love and told Sydney, you know, Misty is lonely. We need to bring another horse. So I need to back up a little. The way she got Misty was really just for writing purposes. Ram McNally paid Grandpa BB, and the agreement always was that the pony would return to Chincoteague Island to breed. But she got her, I love this about her too. She wanted a horse since she was a girl. She didn't get her first horse till she was a middle-aged woman. She was in her 40s. And she was a middle-aged woman when she learned how to ride a horse. So, and then she fell really hard. So, Bridie of the Grand Canyon, this is a fun story. So, a librarian at Gail Borden named Mildred Lathrop had a Sunset Magazine article, I think it was from 1925, about this little donkey, Bridie. And Marguerite read the article and thought it would make for a great kids adventure story. And so she went to the Grand Canyon with her husband, Sydney, who's very afraid of heights, but she didn't know he was afraid of heights. So they did the mule ride down 
<laughs> and it was in February, it was very cool. It was like five degrees when they did this. <laughs> and they were given the mail to deliver. I guess I've never been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. I guess there is a ranch or there's something there. So they were given mail. And in her mind, it was like, well, the mail always gets through. We're going to be fine. So she didn't realize until after the ride that her husband was terrified and speechless. She just thought he was taking in the grandeur of the beauty. He didn't talk the whole time. So of course, in order to write authentically about a little donkey, you need to have a little donkey. So she found a farmer in, it was either Sycamore or Sugar Grove, and she leased this donkey, his name was Jigs, and she would go on trail rides. Um, there's a man that I talk about in the book who grew up, his first job was getting paid 75 cents a week to accompany Marguerite on trails. And he would ride Misty, she would ride Friday, and then there was another boy who would ride um, Jigs the donkey. And apparently Jigs liked to sit down to get the rider off. And Misty liked to go next to the tree to kind of get your legs. <laughs> so back to Milwaukee. So again, like, I'm an educator. I'm not a trained historian. I taught history, but you know, I didn't get my master's in history or anything like that. So I would go to these libraries. And I even did this here at Gail Borden. You know, I walked up to a librarian named Phyllis. I'm like, I'm looking for anything in the local papers about Margaret Henry. They directed me to is it microfilm, microfiche? Like I hadn't done that in forever. I needed a little tutorial on how to do that again and found some articles about her. But so Milwaukee County Historical Society, it's this beautiful building. It was a bank for all the beer barons there. And there's lots of marble and columns. So they, so up where it says love, that's actually an archives there. So I walked in, I'm like, hi, I'm looking for info on Marguerite Henry, who? Like, well, she was a prolific author, and she's from Milwaukee, and she won the Newbery Medal and two Newbery Honors, and, you know. So, with the help of an archivist there, we found her yearbooks. We found, and when I say we, my boyfriend Brian, the handsome man in the back room, helped me quite a bit. But we found this giant Sanborn map, which is this huge map that, that the fire um, departments would use, so we were able to figure out exactly what neighborhood, what street, where the house was in Milwaukee. Saw the activity. She was very active in high school, as you might imagine. Drama club, literary society, uh, Bible study, uh, doing, uh, well, your book, obviously. She wrote a lot for your book. So there she is as a little girl Aww. on the steps of their house. So it's her big sister in the middle, Gertrude. And Marguerite was the youngest of many siblings, so that little boy there is actually her nephew. She had siblings that were quite a bit older than her. And then this is not the house where she grew up, but you can see how there's like the driveway there to the right. That's basically where her house would have been. But this whole street in Milwaukee, the houses kind of look like that. It's a very German neighborhood, obviously bright house, German latte. And there she is. Yeah, in the middle, that was when she was getting ready to be married, her engagement photo. She met her husband in Minocqua. I talk about it in the book. So this is like the Cliff Notes version of my book. <laughs> there is the church where she married her husband, 1923. And then, okay, this is where it gets really funny. So for their wedding, she received five lamps as good. She and Sydney received five lamps. And so Marguerite did not want to hurt anyone's feelings and return any of the gifts. So she went out and didn't tell her husband and bought five tables of how much to put the five lamps. So he wasn't very enthusiastic about that. So she decided she would get a job. And as she wrote, but all I could do was write. So they were living in Chicago at the time. I'm guessing uptown neighborhood. They were on Sheridan Road somewhere, so north side for sure. But anyway, so she walks into some magazine publishers and says, you know, could you please give me a story to write? And if you don't like it, you don't have to pay me. So that's how she got her start. And 
she, the first article she wrote was about the dedication of the American Furniture Mart, which is part of Northwestern's medical campus today. I forget what street it's on. It's a beautiful giant building. And um, she was so enthralled with the pomp and circumstance, the governor of Kentucky was speaking, that she forgot to take notes. So at the end of the speech, she just went through the crowd and said to the governor, this is my first job and I think it will be my last unless you can go over the high points of your speech with me. And he did one better and he pulled out his speech from his pocket and he gave it to her. <laughs> and she said that she summarized it, no, she boiled it down. She said, and I've been boiling stories down ever since. So she wrote, this is from Photo Play Magazine. And um, I just thought, knowing the whole kerfuffle with the lamps, that she wrote an article about ornamental <laughs> lamps well placed and in beauty and restfulness. I would love to have known what her husband thought about that. <laughs> So she wrote for many, she wrote for business magazines, and um, I want to read you an excerpt, but maybe I'll do that at the end, so if my voice is going to disappoint me, I can just recruit one of you to read the excerpt. So back to Marguerite's friends. She had no children, so she had no grandchildren, she had no heirs, but there are still people who remember her, one of them being her very last illustrator. Bonnie Shields is 83. She lives in Idaho. She is an amazing mule artist. Her, her little, her moniker is the Tennessee mule artist. No, she lives in Idaho. But, so Marguerite's last book was called Brown Sunshine of Sawdust Valley. It's about a mule. She contacted Bonnie Shields, who was a young up and coming artist who had read all the Marguerite Henry books and was just, over the moon to be asked to illustrate for her favorite author that she grew up with in childhood. So um, anyway, I asked Bonnie, so I got Bonnie to work with me. She did two illustrations that are in Margaret, Misty, and Me, but part of that was just so I could get to know her and hear those stories about Marguerite. And she spent a lot of time at her house in Rancho Santa Fe. and. So she was friends with her in her later years because Brown Sunshine actually came out the year before she died. So she published it in her 90s. And then of course I've met a lot of Margaret Penn. These were at the University of Minnesota. There are banker's boxes of fan mail and these photos, school photos. And you know, my background in education, I've had a lot of these types of photos over the years. <laughs> I feel kind of bad, I didn't keep them all. <laughs> I, really did, you know, I, I love my students. But what struck me, not only was the eras represented, going from black and white photography to kind of the 70s collars to the 80s permed hair, and that was just like the staying power this woman had. And when I turned over the backs of a lot of these pictures, the kid would just have written their name. So, you know, Sam. And in her handwriting, she would write the last name oh. on there. So that's just a testament to she loved her readers. She And Bonnie shared with me that Marjorie <coughs> viewed all of her readers and children who wrote her letters as her children and grandchildren. And there she is. She did a lot of book signings. She did a lot of publicity events with Misty the Pony. Um, actually, funny story. So, okay, we're gonna kind of talk. I get my hair cut in Dundee. So uh, there was only one source that I read that talked about Sydney having um, his business in Dundee. Because I knew Naperville, and they used to live in Naperville before they moved to Wayne, and I knew Geneva. So I got my hair cut, this is last fall, and I'm like, you know, I wonder if there's a historical society. So I pull up on my phone, Dundee Historical Society. There is one, and it has very weird hours. It's only open like two hours every other Thursday or something like that. <laughs> You're from the Dundee Historical Society, I'm sorry. But like, it's not like a library that's open, you know, yeah. business hours. So it just happened to be exactly that right time window. So I walk in, do my same thing. Hi, I'm here researching Marguerite Henry. I think she and her husband may have owned a business in this community. They said, oh, you need to go to the archives. 
So it's in like a small, like a large home that I think had been a girls' school or something. So it's like not a mansion, but a big, big. So I go up the stairs to the archives. Nothing's digitized. And when I said this to the person working there, she said, "Oh yes, let me check," and went off for about 20 minutes and was going through binders and file folders and then all of a sudden I hear this, aha! <laughs> so apparently the Sydney's, there, there was an opera house at one time in Dundee and the Sydney's bought that, I guess, and then renovated it to be Henry's Five and Dime. So she found a newspaper article and it was for the Brighty promotional tour, the book about the donkey, that the line of children to come in and to meet Brighty, the donkey, and to have their book signed by Marguerite was so long that kids were lined up on that bridge on the Fox River. Oh, so it's down by the Fox, like that business yeah, district. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so this is where the real fun starts. So I went to Pony Penny, didn't really know what to expect, couldn't get anyone to go with me, I went by myself. It's fine. I'm an introvert. I'm a big girl. I could go by myself. But as it turns out, there were other people who went by themselves too. Because a lot of people have it on their bucket list to go to Chincoteague Island and watch those ponies swim. It was like summer camp with friends you hadn't seen in forever. Now, I'm not normally the kind of person that gives my phone number out to someone I meet after talking to them for two minutes. But that happened all the time on Chicotee because it was like, oh, you love the ponies, me too. Oh, Misty, my favorite book too. You know, it was just really cool. So I've been twice now, and this is from last year's swim. So the ponies are, there's there's two herds. There's the Maryland herd. I'm talking about the Virginia herd. There's 150 ponies, and the Saltwater Cowboys are the volunteer fire department. They own the herd. And the reason they swim them over to Chincoteague Island, that right there, what you see with the trees in the background, that's Assateague Island, it's a wildlife refuge. So they don't want the ponies to overpopulate. So they will swim them to Chincoteague. It's during their kind of, their fair, their, their carnival week, and then they have this auction. It's all the true events from Misty of Chincoteague. So people line up like it's an inaugural parade to water, they, you know, I was on a kayak and the ponies swim. It takes, it's about the length of a horse race. Oh. Um, the, the time length, I don't know geographically, but it's not that far. So the first time I went, I was as close to those ponies swimming in front of me as to about the fourth row here. And you could hear them and just see their ears over the water. And it was like, I had the chills. It was the coolest thing. And there they are. And you can see all the fans in the background. And there they are. And um, just for those of you that have a very soft heart, they vet the ponies prior to the swim. So if there are any mares that are too close to giving birth or foals that are too little, because that's part of the storyline of Misty is that she was starting to drown. But they, and then if there are horses that are too old or have an injury, they won't make them swim. It's only the ones that they know can. And then they parade them through the main street downtown. And um, yeah, it's their, their adorable. And what's amazing is, I, as I was researching, I've been studying, there's a lot of Facebook groups, a lot of fan pages. Um, there's a stallion riptide. He's got these long Fabio locks and he's got like thousands of people on his fan page and that. But when I saw them in real life, like they look like horses, but when you see them in real life, they're small. They're like 13 hands, but they just, they're, they're really cool ponies. There's Misty, three. I'm taking a selfie with her. So this is at, um, there's a woman named Kendi Allen. She's a retired school librarian. And she bought Misty Two, who was a chestnut pinto. This is in the late 80s. And Misty Two was, I don't wanna say abused, but just had never been trained to ride. And she was at the Chicoteague Miniature Pony Farm. And so Kendi was like a quarter horse woman, but you know she loved the Margaret Henry books. And then her husband, 
kind of said, well, what if we got that pony? And she was like, well, okay. <laughs> so she said that what was happening is fans were going up and like plucking the main hairs out. So she was very shy because like there was too much drama with tourists. So anyway, she said the horse got onto a horse trailer, like get me out of here. And so she took the pony home and it was, I think she was 12 or 13, like she was older and they trained her to ride and she went out and was a little hunter pony, like she did great. And she said it was like the best pony, best horse she's ever had. And so anyway, she wrote a letter to Marguerite Henry and just said, hey, I want you to know I have Misty the second, your stories still matter. We love her, she's the best pony. And Marguerite Henry called her. And she thought it was, she like couldn't get over it because this is her very favorite author, you know. And Marguerite was in her 80s at the time, living in California. Marguerite would call and talk to Kendi's daughter and run story ideas past her. So her daughter was like 10 at the time. And Marguerite didn't realize there was a three hour time difference between the East Coast and California. She'd call it like midnight. <laughs> and Kendi said she would wake her daughter up because it's Marguerite Henry. She, she can hear them giggling in the back room and that. So this is Kendi's farm. She's got, um, she's a misty bloodline preservationist. And then the other thing is they round up the ponies uh, three times a year. They only do the swim once, but if she you think is really hot and the mosquitoes love me, I had welts coming back. It was so worth it, but <clears throat> the spring and fall roundups are very cool. I went this last fall, I took my mom with me, and you can get up really close to them. And there, there are groupies of the ponies there with their cameras, with the big lenses like that and stuff. It's, it's just so cool. And I took my mom, and what was amazing, so we were there, this is on Acid Creek. We were walking along, and another mom about my mom's age, and two daughters around my age stopped and said, would you take a picture of us? I said, sure. And then um, they explained they were there because their mom had just recovered from breast cancer and they were celebrating with her. And the woman, then I said, well, will you please take a picture of me with my mom? And the woman <clears throat> who took the picture's name is Misty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So back to all those questions I started out with. Was she an equestrian lady or a horse lover from the ground? She was a horse lover and a rider. She was a trail rider. She loved riding the trails in Wayne. Who was she before she was a famous author? She was a very hardworking woman. You think about for her era, the 1920s, she was out there, you know, getting stories, reporting for business magazines and that. You know, it's, it's perfect we're talking about her in Women's History Month. Could I find people who still remembered her? Fans and friends and family, yes, to all of that. Not so much the family, although there is a woman who lives in Sheboygan who's like a second cousin to Sydney. And why do her books have such an enduring hold? I think it's because of, well, several factors, but the love behind it. She really thought about her readers and she did her homework and, you know, spent months researching and she had a fan newsletter for a while and that's how the book Dear Readers and Writers came to be. Um, and then what is the appeal of Chincoteague and its wild ponies? Um, I think it's the fact that this beautiful book from our childhood, the elements of it are real and happening today and that it's such a, a happy place that you go there and there's just joy. And you know, there's not always a lot of joy in the the day to day of living. I'm gonna, I'm kind of winding down here, but I wanted to tell you this story. So um, I launched the book at Briar Fest, which is like it sounds, a festival of Briar horses, and it's at Kentucky Horse Park, and there's tens of thousands of people there. And I had okay, so this is my travel misty because I didn't want to I didn't want to bring my childhood misty in case something happened. Because when I was at Briar Fest, a little kid whose head was about at the level of misty went out with his grabby hands, and I was kind of like trying not to panic and snap some kind of <laughs> rude comment in. But anyway, um, a young woman 
saw the book, saw Misty, and she said, oh, Misty. And I said, are you a Misty fan? She said, yes. And when I was in fourth grade, I hated reading. And my fourth grade teacher gave me a copy of Misty of Chincoteague. And I read that, and I read all of the rest of her books. And I'm a reader today. So that's just such a beautiful legacy. I said, oh, I gotta take a picture, this is perfect. And when I first shared that story, so the Chincoteague Pony Penning week is like the week or two weeks after Briarfest. And I was telling this at the Chincoteague Library and it was like retired educators and librarians there. And it was like a, we're all like crying. <laughs> I, I couldn't even get it out. They were all, it was, it was amazing. So I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, I think I can probably read you a little passage here. And then you can ask me questions if you like. Um, this is not at all horse related. But as I, I found an article that she had written about her writing in her early career, and I was cracking up as I read it, and it just reminded me of I Love Lucy. <laughs> okay. Um, Marguerite did so much ghost writing. She wrote an article in 1935 for Writer's Digest magazine titled Adventures of a Ghost Writer. The essay shares Marguerite's methodologies for pitching stories, interviewing, and writing articles. The seven page personal narrative reads like a script from I Love Lucy. In the beginning of the article, Marguerite describes herself as a hardworking plotter about whom an analyst reported no imagination. One who knows deep down in her heart that no amount of mental shinnying will elevate her to the genus genius, but right she must. In order to get an interview, she would go in person to the potential interviewee's office and ask to see the man, because back then it was always a man, by name. Actually, she didn't really ask. Marguerite would wear a fresh cut flower and tell the secretary she was Miss Henry there to see Mr. So-and-so. Never mind the fact that she was married to Sydney and technically a Mrs., not a Miss. <laughs> and this is Marguerite writing. The mystery of not knowing who the caller is or how she happened to select him to interview is much more provocative. When a woman's name is presented, he likewise thinks of three things. A friend of my wife's, a school date romance, or is it that one I met in the Bahamas? With two such delightful possibilities, he can do not but see her. Wearing a flower and showing up at an office was just one technique. In her pursuit of an, of an interview, she once waited on Milwaukee's Astor Hotel steps for an hour and a half to see incumbent governor, incumbent Wisconsin Governor Walter J. Kohler on the campaign trail. He was scheduled to speak at a women's luncheon and was fashionably late. As a police escort accompanied him, Mr. Kohler, like a ripe flower surrounded by sucking bees, tried to get out of his car and hurry into the hotel. I joined the swarm. A campaign worker asked if Marguerite wanted to shake hands with the governor. She meekly said yes. When introduced, she burst out with, don't you think that the industrial distributor is a very important factor in the economic scheme of things? The governor replied yes and asked why. She explained she was writing an article for a publication and wanted to use a statement. As he wove his way through the hotel to a spot of honor, Marguerite tagged along, peppering him with questions, thus gaining a complete interview. Later, the young reporter visited the governor's grand private home in Kohler to get his statement okayed. During her visit, she photographed the governor, his wife, and their gardens. She turned the trip to get her article signed off into another story, submitting an article to a home and garden magazine. Okay, now I'm gonna read you. Hmm. Okay, just a couple more paragraphs here. Another ghostwriting gig involved touring the Blatt's Brewing Company in Milwaukee. As she learned the brewing process, proceeding from the bottle shed, stockhouse, carbonic gas rooms, keg filling departments, and more, each hospitable foreman from the varying stops on the tour would proffer a cold foaming stein of beer. Marguerite stated she was not aware the alcoholic content of draft beer was higher than bottled. 
<laughs> Part of the job was to take photographs of the plant. She wrote, in my mellow state, I saw picture possibilities in everything. So exactly twice as many pictures have been taken as the budget called for. <laughs> the editor only mildly rebuked her for the unnecessary photos. A mellow marguerite had snapped a small fortune. <clears throat> um, would it be okay if I took a selfie? I try to take a selfie of, of my talks, of my group, because it's just fun. Sure. <laughs> And everybody, um, her books are available for purchase and signing after the program. And we also have some briar horses on the table in the corner. So Not please come up and just take for them. fun to look at. <laughs> just to look at, yeah. The horses are just to look at. The books are for purchase. Thank you so much to Susan Freeland. It was a, a wonderful hour of storytelling, and I think we all got to know. Um, not just Susan, but uh, Marguerite Henry. Um, she's not just a name from the past. She's still, I think her spirit is still very much with us.